For USCFootball.com, I'm Keely Orr here with Dan Weber for instant analysis of USC's Tuesday practice of mock game week. Now, Dan, before we get into practice, USC has a starting quarterback. Clay Helton told the media today that JT Daniels is USC's starting quarterback for the Fresno State game. He also gave us a depth chart list for the quarterback position only. We'll find out, out about the rest of the team uh, next Friday. But the order goes JT Daniels, true freshman Keenan Slovis as QB2, and then uh, Matt Fink, and then Jack Sears as the fourth quarterback on the depth chart. So, Dan, let's get your overall reactions, first thoughts about this development. Well, I mean, I think Clay read, you know, the whole situation correctly in terms of it really is time to get a quarterback decided. You you need to go, you're going to do mock game week, you've got to know who your starting quarterback is. And he, he made the point, uh, no other positions are determined until the, the depth chart comes out Friday of next week. So, you know, that's, that's where you, you want to be on this. Uh, had, had a lot of good things to say about JT, about how, uh, you know, all the quarterbacks are better. And he, that's there's no, no kidding there at all. I mean, Keaton Slovis is so much better than anybody had any right to expect uh, that they would see in, in the spring. Uh, but if Matt Fink and, uh, and Jack Sears have, have their games have, have improved so much, uh, you know, I don't disagree with Clay when he said this is a, a team that you got four quarterbacks that could probably win you all of them could win you games mm -hmm. uh, they liked uh, JT's uh, competitiveness the fact that you know he didn't uh, here's a guy who started 11 games you know, he was one of the couple of best quarterbacks in the country on a national championship high school team at modern day and didn't take that badly came out competed every day understood new system new coaches we've got to uh, you know shake everything up start over again you don't have uh, your place uh, and that the JT handled that situation they believe really really well uh, that his consistency stability all of the things that that he can do uh, made him the choice I, I think again the surprise choice was uh, was the rest of the uh, um, of the depth chart at quarterback but uh, I, I liked it we haven't heard people able to say a lot of really good stuff about JT and I thought he you know survived a really difficult situation last year with an offense that didn't kind of know who the heck it was and what it was trying to do I thought he handled himself really well and uh, and I think he got rewarded for it as well as how he's practiced this year I think to be uh, be the number one quarterback in this group with all of them having raised their games is uh, is a real accomplishment for JT. So, uh, so good for him and good for him for, you know, people to be able to say uh, some really good things about JT. Uh, and and I think it's I think it's the right call based on everything that we've seen in uh, in practice. And uh, I'm interested in, in how the rest of that depth chart is going to work because uh, you've got two other quarterbacks. Uh, Matt Fink and Jack Sears, who have stepped in. Uh, Matt, uh, when uh, JT got hurt at Utah, and, and then Jack Sears the next week yep. after Matt got hurt. So you've got two guys who played in big time, you know, football games. And Keaton, uh, right now, would be the guy you'd go to. That will be interesting because, uh, as, as Clay said, and everybody says, you're one play away uh, from being out there. But uh, it tells you how much they. I mean, I think we've all felt that Keaton has done some just unbelievably good things for a true freshman, you know, three-star kid that uh, you know wasn't one of those camp kids that everybody knew about, and uh, and yet you know the last two scrimmages, uh, it hasn't probably been where he was um, uh, previously, and yet they really. We knew they really liked him. They really like him. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask you. If you've been watching instant analysis or just paying attention to practice reports, it wasn't necessarily a surprise that JT was named the starter. I think the more surprising thing was that Keaton Slovis was the second quarterback, the backup quarterback, given that it seemed like when, when he was put into real game-like situations, uh, the fall showcase, the scrimmage prior to that, it seemed like it became a little bit too much for him. The game didn't really slow down for him, as Clay likes to say. So do you really expect, I mean, they named him the backup quarterback, but if something, if JT were to go down, do you really expect a true freshman to go in there and then and, and replace him? I mean, it's a really, it's a really good question. I don't have an answer uh, for that, uh, and uh, that will be interesting to see how that develops as the year goes on. Uh, because you've got a got a Matt Fink who's you know bigger, stronger, 
uh, a real kind of a natural leader, a confident guy. You've got Jack, who's such an athlete, uh, both of whom really stepped up uh, when they got their chance. So uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I don't think I can give you that that answer right now. Yeah. And going forward, what does this mean for Matt Fink and Jack Sears? Matt Fink entered the transfer portal portal during this offseason, came back thinking that he might have a, a better opportunity to win the job. Uh, he didn't. And then Jack Sears has been that guy who's been in the mix and keeps uh, not winning that battle. Now, we didn't get to talk to the quarterbacks or offensive coordinator Graham Harrell today. We will get to talk to them tomorrow and get the reaction to the news. But what do you expect for those two guys, especially from Jack Sears, who has the potential to transfer now? Yeah, I mean, you know, there are situations where you know, school porter systems and things are available and all of that. I don't think I think Matt Fink has really said, "I want to be, a, I'm a Trojan. I want to be a Trojan. I want to, you know, be with my guys and, and all of that." Uh, uh, so I don't anticipate him doing anything other than trying to, you know, move up the the ladder. With Jack, I don't know. I think there are systems with his athleticism where he could really really shine and wouldn't be in a situation where you've got uh, four guys who they like all of them and uh, uh, so I don't know I think tomorrow will be interesting to talk uh, Clay said you know that they took it really well and that they went out and practiced um, uh, they thought they practiced well today uh, knowing what the situation was I don't know once you have a you know some time to think about it I, again that's a question I don't know that we can answer right now. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, we thought the news of the of the day today was going to be that it was the first time uh, in a while that the media has not been able to see USC's practices in its entirety. So we got to see the first 20 minutes of practice. We got some injury updates because of that, uh, but we got mostly an update from Clay Helton. But we didn't get to see the rest of practice. We didn't get to see what JT was like as the starting quarterback. Does it do any drills change or whatnot? But what did you take away from what we were able to see in the first 20 minutes? Well, <laughs> We got here early. Uh, if you read the early ghost notes, uh, you will see a TikTok minute by minute of everything that we pretty much saw. So I don't know we'll do that again, but just <laughs> just for the heck of it today and kind of, you know, how they how they got out and got into practice and uh, the fact that the uh, wide receivers meeting obviously went late and practice uh, started late uh, because of that. Um, but uh, I think what I wanted to ask Clay was, did you pretty much do it the way you've been doing it? And Clay said, yes, that's what they did. He right away said, we had full pads today. We're going in uh, shoulder pads tomorrow and, uh, and Thursday. So uh, I think the message is there that this team is, is going to, and he did say immediately, they're going to compete until Friday a week. Um, so. So I like that, and I like it if it's kind of a continuation of exactly how they've been practicing. I think they've been practicing, for the most part, the way you would like to see a team practice. They'll get more chance with the uh, receivers and with JT and, and, and getting a chance for him to refine uh, all of the things he has to be able to do in this offense. But, uh, but I, like, you know, I like the sound of we're going in shoulder pads tomorrow and the next day. We're going in full pads today. Uh, we're going to be competitive as heck. I mean, there you have it. That's yeah. what that's what we would like to see. Even if we're not there, it's good to know that that's what they are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And as far as the timing as the quarterback decision goes, it seemed like we we really didn't know whether or not Clay Hilton was going to push this later just because he was so vague about it. But it seems like he made that decisive decision now because what we've been saying all of fall camp, at some point you need to give your quarterback enough time to get chemistry with his wide receivers. I, I mean, I think we should commend. Do you think we should commend Clay for making this decision or was this something that he should have made earlier? Where do you lie on Clay making this decision now at this point of, of fall? I'm good to go right here. I think, yeah. I think he wanted at the most high profile position a demonstration that everybody's going to have to compete and that JT, like everybody else, is going to have to compete for his spot. And I, I guess you could have justified doing it last week, but you know, that was the chance you kind of take after, uh, uh, if you do it before the fall football showcase, people can say, oh, it was, you know, it was a, wasn't really a competition. It was a foregone conclusion and all that. So I think they have that, uh, that going for them 
if they do it this way. I think this was the right way to do it. I think two weeks is plenty of time for JT. He's been getting more reps. Uh, I think the big wild card here is uh, instead of having three and four receivers like they had last year, now you've got eight to ten. Yeah. And that's a lot more throws to, mm -hmm. to get on the same page, to know which guy really is going to know when the uh, back shoulder throw is coming or which guy uh, are you, you know can go down and dig and, and, and grab that ball in the end zone or which guy will come back and get the, uh, you know, the ball that you underthrow and let the defender go by him. That can only happen with reps and reps and reps and yep. reps. And uh, so I think they've got plenty of time uh, the way they the way they do practice now. I think they've got plenty of time. They have plenty of reps. But uh, I don't know that they could have waited much longer. Yeah. I agree. As far as those injury updates that I mentioned previously, uh, we got word about uh, Devin Williams. He did not show out uh, in pads. He was uh, d not dressed out today. Uh, Helton said that he just has a quad contusion and should be back sometime this week. So he d it didn't seem serious. I think he said day to day. So, yeah. you know, who knows? Maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Abdul Malik McLean was not dressed out. We didn't get official update on him. Uh, and then uh, good news for USC. Vivai Malapea returned for the first time since he tweaked his knee uh, a couple weeks ago, a week ago, a week and a two half, weeks. two yeah. weeks ago. Um, and so Clay said that he was only limited to half of uh, what he would normally do in a practice, but Vive wants to do more. But they're holding him back precautiously just to, to ease him in and to, to work. But you got to talk to Vivai, and he sounds like he's going to be ready for the, the Fresno State game. Yeah, he said absolutely. you got to get his wind going, his cardio a little bit. Uh, but uh, he's very – he looked good, very upbeat about things. I think what it's showing you is – and Mike Jinks even referenced it, the running backs coach um, – how much football have these guys played? I mean, Stephen Carr has pretty much been, you know, injured uh, for much of his two years. Marquis Stepp still has his red shirt. Keenan Kristen is a true freshman, a track star. So basically, Vi is the guy with the experience, the guy that can maybe, uh, you know, because they're maybe not seeing all the opportunities and things like that. And I think Vi is a guy who um, he's been out there before. He's yeah. done it. He can see those opportunities. So I think it's a big plus to get Vi back. Yeah, without a doubt. Now, besides the quarterback news, we actually got to talk about talk to the players and assistant coaches before we even found out who was the starting quarterback. Uh, but we got to break down the fall showcase. The coaches have had time to, to look at what uh, the tape of that, that event. And you got to talk to Tim Drevno, and that was something that was a little bit of a concern coming out of that showcase. What is this O-line going to be in 2019? Will USC be able to run the ball? What did he have to say about the performance we saw on Saturday? I said, you know, one of the things everybody was pretty pleased with was uh, with Aaron Osmus and the fact that this offensive line is stronger, more athletic, uh, what, why didn't we see more push and more? And he talked about, and he didn't disagree. Uh, he said, yeah, they are much stronger. They're more athletic. Uh, we need to get their pad. I mean, he said, we need to get more push and we need to get their pad levels down. He said, there are things we can do uh, to work on it. But uh, he, uh, he admitted that you know, they, they got, a, got some work to do to get there. Uh, they're not panicking. It doesn't sound like um, they feel like they're within range. Uh, coach Mike, Jen you know Mike Jinks, a running backs coach. Again, they feel like they've got the you know the components to make it work. Uh, that that they're not that far away, and we'll see. I mean, you know, they. I don't get the sense that there's any feeling of you know panic or we just something's not right or here or whatever. I think they get the sense. You get the sense talking to them that we can work this out. We can get it done. We can be pretty decent you know, running the football. Uh, so uh, they know everybody's looking at them and talking about them. You know, so. To play devil's advocate, though, I feel like they told us similar things last season, and it doesn't seem like they really figured it out last season. So do we take their word for it when they tell us this, uh, this time around? Well, it's a whole a completely different system, and, and people are in different places and, and all of that. However, uh, it's probably not easy, and I think Drevno was correct when he said that it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to run the ball, not just against that front seven. It's a really good front seven, but they were geared to take the run, you know take the run away. So if if you've got somebody that's going to take the run away, you don't just keep running it and running it up in there uh, a lot. So they didn't run the ball what 17 times, and they threw it 66 times. Yeah. So that tells you how the defense was was geared. That's probably not going to be the way most teams are going to play them. Uh, and if they do play them like that, they'll take the 600 and some yards, 20 yards or whatever passing 
and just say, okay, well, that's, that's what you gave us. So uh, I think they think it was, you know, somewhat situational. Uh, somewhat, they really think, the, you know, that front seven is really good, and I, I think they are too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess the hope is that that front seven makes this uh, offensive, you know, offensive line and the running back group together. And I don't think we saw some of the things they would do, some of the yeah. ways they would go after people if, um, if they got into that situation. I think there are some, you know, counters and things like that that they could run that they didn't run and they weren't going to run. Um, so, but I think right now we may have to, I think we got to take it on faith a little bit, not so much faith in last year. Sure. There's, there's no sense in doing that, but, uh, but a little bit of you know faith and seeing if they can uh, they can get it together and uh, i don't know that we know yeah i would agree there uh but dan any final thoughts before we wrap it up on a newsy tuesday practice yeah newsy tuesday yeah that's uh uh we'll uh i think the thing i like is the fact that we get we have a sense of how they're practicing we couldn't have done this last year they were kind of all over the lot and you know, coming out of, you know, fall camp, not thinking they knew what they were doing on offense or we didn't know and not knowing what they were doing in practice. I get the sense that what they've been doing, they're going to keep on doing and that we have a frame of reference that we didn't have last year. So I think when we talk to players and we talk to coaches about what they're doing, even if we're not seeing practice, we're going to have a little more sense of what the heck's going on than than sometimes last year watching practice. I mean, you could watch it and say, I don't know what they're doing. And I'm not sure they do, uh, especially running the ball and, and throwing into coverage. And they had to, you know, keep a tight end uh, blocking so they didn't have a, you know, take away a receiver. Made life pretty difficult. Uh, I don't, I think kind of we know this is the direction this team, this is who this team is. They're just going to try to get better uh, at what they're doing. Yeah. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up for the Tuesday practice of mock game week. For Dan Weber, I'm Keely Yor. For more, check out uscfootball.com.